and welcome to all of you. You're watching Tech 24, France 24's tech show. The Principality of Monaco is reaffirming its ambition for a digital transition with the introduction of coding courses in preschool, e-health services and connected roads. The Rock is taking a tech turn. In just a few minutes, we'll speak to Frédéric Gonta, the nation's recently appointed chief digital officer. And in Test 24, we try the Prima Bionic Vision System, a tiny wireless photovoltaic implant that communicates with a camera mounted on glasses. But first, artificial intelligence is now being harnessed by French police officers to try and stamp out crime. A new piece of technology based on algorithms has been tested in a string of regions, and the results have been positive. Thomas Waterhouse and our colleagues at France 2 report. It might look like an average day out on the beat, but these officers haven't chosen this street in this specific neighborhood at random. An algorithm has calculated that burglaries and the theft of vehicles are more likely to happen here today than elsewhere. The patrol closely follows what the software tells them on their telephone. So we're going to zoom in on our area. The red patches are the worst affected by robberies. It's fairly reliable. It gives us a more specific area to focus on than before. Predicting delinquency was the idea behind the smash hit Minority Report. Since that film came out, fiction has become a reality, even if it's less dramatic than on the big screen. This technology has been tested by forces in 11 regions across France. The software aggregates years' worth of data on burglaries and thefts and then determines particular areas at risk for any given day. In the past, we used to put drawing pins into a map with the data that we had. This, though, is software designed to anticipate and prevent crime. Officers now carry out spot checks where the risk of theft is highest. It acts as a deterrent. It can push criminals out of one area to another, but then they sometimes get caught at a road check. According to the colonel who's been overseeing the experiment, the software seems to be working. Across the board during these trials, we have seen better results in these 11 regions compared to the national average. That means that we've seen less burglaries. This software has already been tested in the UK, Italy and extensively across the US. Cities like Chicago have even used mathematical formulae to predict who will commit crime based on profiling data. The feedback has been mixed. Some overseas communities have now abandoned the program, accusing it of simply predicting what we already know. The mathematical formulae are of course adapted to each country and to its legislation. In France, it's illegal for personal data to be stored in the software and according to police, that's crucial to the programme's future success. Well, let's bring in our in-house expert, Dan and Jay Cattlecar. Hello and welcome, Dan. Hello, Julia. So geolocalization is being used in the U.S. by police officers and one such project by Google is called SensorVault and it's actually very controversial right now. Well, yes, Sensor Vault is a huge database that contains detailed location records of millions of devices from all over the world. Google normally uses uh, location history to target ads and also to provide certain services like uh, traffic estimates. But according to a report in the New York Times, uh, the law enforcement authorities in the U.S. have tapped into this huge database in order to solve crimes. Without people knowing. Yes, but they do so by uh, getting a special warrant. It's called a geofence warrant, uh, which enables them to uh, tap into this database for information about the devices that uh, were located near the crime uh, zone. And by then, these uh, then the process is further narrowed down, and then it's zeroed in onto a few devices uh, whose information is then provided by Google. Now, this has raised, of course, uh, a lot of controversy. First of all, because it uh, raises private privacy concerns. We have seen what happened uh, about the use of uh, data in the case of Facebook earlier, and now here we have another tech giant uh, in which uh, this data is being used, as some private experts say, privacy experts say, uh, and they have termed it as questionable. And secondly, even though this uh, technique could help uh, solve the crime, uh, experts also believe that this also could result uh, in some innocent people um, getting implicated in some cases. Yeah, it's so a yeah, form of profiling in a way. Yeah. 
And what can we do if we don't want to be part of that database? Well, only data associated with location history forms uh, the part of this uh, sensor vault. So in, essentially what you have to do is you can log in to uh, your Google account, go in uh, the, the personal info and privacy settings, and then uh, there's this option of web and app activity, which you can turn off, and you can also turn off the location history. Thank you, Dan and Jay Kalokar there. Now, it's the second smallest country in the world after the Vatican, but it wants to become a pioneer in terms of digital transformation. The Principality of Monaco has unveiled its plan for a digital switch. With e-government services, coding courses in schools, and connected roads, Monegasque citizens are preparing to live on a rock 4.0. Well, to talk more about this, I'm joined by Frederic Gonta, uh, Monaco's chief digital officer. Hello. Good morning. You were recently appointed to help give Monaco an edge in global digital competition. What concrete measures do you plan on taking? Well, we hope that two things are going to happen. First, digital is going to be used in the principality to make sure that our economy will grow in the next decades. In an environment where we have very few square meters, having the value added of digital is key to growing our economy. Secondly, our other priority is to make sure that our unique quality of life and attractivity is maintained through the years. Concretely, that means different things. That means that we're going to build some infrastructure to make sure our economy grows, 5G, so very cloud, optic fiber. We're going to make sure that all our exchanging and deals in the real economy are fully digitalized, signature, storage, relationship with the administration. We're going to make sure we build excel, um, a real estate and clean tech excellences pool. We want to make sure we become leader in real estate tech and clean tech. And last but not least, we want to diversify our economy. To do so, we're going to launch ICOs to attract new companies that couldn't come before because we don't have a stock exchange. On the other hand, we're going to grow our unique quality of life, education first. We're going to be, by end of this year, the first country in the world where students from three years old to 14 years old study coding every single week for more than an hour. Also, we're going to grow the quality of life by having a fully digitalized 3D, 3D Monaco, which will be able to forecast and anticipate every phenomenon. So, for example, where are we going to build something in Monaco we'll be able to anticipate the impact on traffic, uh, where we're going to build a new building, we're going to be able to anticipate the effect on the 4G network and where we should put new antennas. Last but not least, we want to grow our health service to make sure that uh, we give more personalized care and better diagnostic and treatment. Uh, when it comes to the network, you've already announced the rollout of 5G. Why did you choose to go with Huawei at a time when other governments in Europe are being very prudent? Huawei is a long-lasting partner. We have worked with them for the last years, with Monaco Telecom, our operator, owned by Xavier Huawei is a leader in 5G. They have created our 4G, our 3G, and they are great at smart city. When we visited China with the Prince, they showed us what they could do in terms of smart city and 5G. And we are convinced that they will be a great industrial partner to sustain and to connect our digital transformation and that they will help us make a new decades of prosperity for our economy and keep our attractivity at the highest level in the world. Frederic Gonta, Chief Digital Officer of the Principality of Monaco, thank you very much for speaking to us here on Tech24. Thank you so much. It's time now for Test 24. The Prima Bionic Vision System is a tiny wireless photovoltaic implant that communicates with a camera mounted on glasses. It's an incredible system, Dan, and it's set to really help a lot of people out there who are uh, losing their vision. Tell us more about it. Well, yes, it's meant for people who suffer from dry AMD. It's a macular degeneration disease, which is mostly age-related. So here you can see uh, I have a prototype of the system and there are three parts. One, uh, the glasses and the camera. Second is the computer, which is uh, attached to the glasses. And third is this implant, which is, uh, which is called Prima. And this is implanted at the back of the retina. I have uh, an eye model. So if you imagine this to be the front of your eye, 
this is where the implant is placed. So at the back. It's at the back. Now, what's interesting is that this implant is very tiny. Uh, its thickness is one third of that of uh, the human hair. And uh, it contains 378 electrodes. These are photovoltaic electrodes, so they are able to convert light into electrical signals. Now, this is how it works. So the camera which is attached to these glasses, it captures the images. These images are then processed using this pocket computer and then they are turned into near infrared radiation, which is then, I mean, there's a projector here as well, and this projector projects this uh, near infrared light on into the eye and which re ultimately reaches this very tiny implant. And because of the uh, electrodes, it's able to convert this signal, light signal, into uh, electrical signals, which then stimulates the nerves of uh, the retina, and then that's how a visual perception is created. Now, is now, it a visual perception like we would see, or is no, it maybe a, sh a shadow? A pattern, or? a shadow. But again, the other important aspect of this entire system is training. So it's not that you'll just put on these glasses and people who suffer from dry AMD, they'll be able to see images, because they have to get used to uh, used to these images. So that's why training is also very important. And so over a course of time, they will be able to see uh, better and clearer images. That's And the company wants to develop this product into something that will eventually help uh, these people read and also identify objects. A fascinating innovation there. Thank you, Dan and Jay Cattlecar. That brings us to the end of this week's edition of Tech 24, but you can watch it again on our website, france24.com. See you next time. Thank you.